and welcome to the Creative Toolkit for Marketers. I'm Shauna Mascarelli, and I'm a senior creative producer here at BMG Studios. I'm also a video editor in my own right and a voiceover artist. In this video, we'll be covering the recommended best practices for recording your own presentations on your computer. Whether you're a business professional, a teacher who needs to post a video for your class, or just a beginner to the world of webcasts and YouTube blogging, you'll find this video has some useful tips and explanations for just about anybody. There are two key factors to success when recording your own web videos, technical elements and aesthetic forethought. In this video, we'll cover the technical setup, which includes recommended equipment, recording apps, and some basic configuration. Then we'll hop into prepping your shot, which covers the aesthetics of your environment, or shot look, where to place your mic and camera, and some performance tips. And lastly, we'll cover the basics of the actual recording and final output of your video file. You may be tempted to skip to a section you're most interested in, however, I strongly suggest you watch the whole video, as each piece builds upon the last. But if you must, I encourage you to at least watch the section on aesthetics, as that is the easiest and cheapest way to enhance your video. So without further ado, let's jump in. While most computers these days come with webcams and microphones built in, you might want to consider upgrading. Most built-in webcams are only 720p, and I don't think I've purchased a 720p TV since 2007. So at the least, I recommend a 1080p camera. Logitech tends to have the best options that are both good quality and within a consumer price range. You can see here the range you can expect to find online, about $200 to $350. The Logitech Brio can even do 4K video, which would be super awesome if you can shoot in that resolution. However, the price tag is a bit steep. The key features you want to look for when finding an external webcam are resolution, at minimum 1080p, and the frames per second. Anything less than 30 frames per second is gonna make you look choppy. The field of view is also something to consider. The wider the view, the more the camera can capture in a small space. So 90 degrees is pretty decent for the average office. You start to get narrower and your face gets bigger and bigger in the screen. So you have to physically back up to get a pleasing shot. But be wary of going too wide, like 180 degrees, as that can cause the fisheye effect. Those cameras are usually designed for surveillance or conference rooms that need to capture everyone in the image at the same time. Next is microphones. The trouble with your built-in microphone on your computer is that it sits pretty far away from you. And in the business of sound, you generally want your microphone pretty close to you. For webcasting and digital recording, I recommend the Blue Yeti USB mic. It's a pretty standard favorite of veteran vloggers and YouTubers. This is a desk mounted mic and is good looking enough that it wouldn't be horrendous if it was visible in your shot. It's plug and play, so you don't need to do hardly any configuring. And it has the option to change your operation mode between stereo, cardioid, omnidirectional, and bidirectional, as you can see here on this little switch. These little shapes kind of give you an idea of what that sound field or pickup pattern looks like. And having this versatility can be very useful depending on the type of video you're planning to do. For standard presentation style, I would recommend keeping this on the cardioid setting, which is the one that looks like a little upside down heart. That's going to cut out the most sound that isn't you. For two person interviews, you might want to try the stereo or bi-directional settings. You can also adjust the volume or level in real time with the volume knob on the front. There are other microphones out there like this if you want to search, but I think you'll find this is a pretty good standard. The other option is a lapel microphone. Make sure when buying one that it's a USB mic. The USB lapels are fairly new to the market, so the majority of search results you'll get are still the analog style with the little headphone jack. If you already have one of those, you'll need some additional equipment to get it to work on your computer. That is, if you don't already have an analog input port on your sound card, which most laptops and PCs don't have anymore these days. The key features on lapel mics to consider are their price point. They're usually pretty cheap. And like the Blue Yeti, they're plug and play. These guys clip directly to your shirt, so you'll want to get creative with hiding the cable if you can. Just tuck it in. The pros of a lapel mic over a desktop mounted mic is that it's smaller, so it's less visible, and tends to provide better ambient sound reduction. The downside is that if you're not careful, you could get a lot of extra noise from your shirt rubbing up against the receiver. Pro tip, unless you're outside, you really don't need that windscreen. So pull that little poof off the top for a cleaner look. You'll notice I didn't even mention a headset with a microphone on it. And that's because no, 
Just don't. Okay, now that we have our hardware figured out, let's look at our software options. The internet is full of screen recording software, so it can be confusing figuring out which app is right for you. I've broken my list down into three categories for you. Let's start with the A-Team. These guys are the heavy lifters. They were built specifically for the task of recording high quality webcam and screen cap videos. If you're willing to spend some cash, I strongly recommend Camtasia. It's probably the best consumer product out there. It comes with an editing platform built in, so you can edit your video when you're done and allows you to export to multiple formats. It's got the simplest interface too, so it's fairly beginner friendly. As of this video, one license is about $250. For an extra 50, you can get their maintenance program, which allows you to update to the next version for free as they roll out, which happens about every year at this point. OBS is an open source app that stands for Open Broadcaster Software. The best thing about OBS is it's free. So what are the downsides? Well, OBS assumes you kind of know what you're doing. It's designed for professional broadcasters to allow them to screen record and webcast or stream directly through the app. So unless you have experience with video codecs and processing, it can be a bit of an intimidating app. It also doesn't have an editing application built in like Camtasia does. So you either have to be perfect in one take, have the ability to edit in another application, or have a video partner you can send the files to so they can edit it for you. Over here are the easy standards, and I say easy only because their features are simple and most people are familiar with them already. QuickTime comes standard on all Macs, and it has the ability to record the screen, webcam, and microphone. This works great if all you want to do is record yourself speaking or your screen, and the quality is pretty good. But you don't have options to change your recording quality or your output file type. With the ATM, you can select which files and codecs you want to use, MP4, AVI, MOV, etc. With QuickTime and PowerPoint, you only get the preset that Apple and Microsoft have chosen for you. One other caveat of QuickTime is it does not record the system audio. For whatever reason, Apple didn't program in this capability, probably to prevent piracy. So if you're doing a screen cap and you want to play a video or music file as part of your presentation, it can only be heard through your speakers and then recorded on the mic. This isn't always ideal. There are workarounds for this, like the Soundflower plugin, but it gets complicated and it's not very user-friendly. PowerPoint for PC now comes with an option that allows you to do screen and webcam recordings. It operates much in the same way as QuickTime does for the Mac. However, it does have a price point since you need to purchase Microsoft Office to use PowerPoint. It's also not exactly easy to access within PowerPoint. As familiar as people are with PowerPoint, it seems to be somewhat difficult for some users to get it to work reliably or even appear at all. There are third-party plugins you can use, but now we're going down the rabbit hole and it's quickly becoming not easy after all. Lastly, down here, I have the last resorts. Now, this list could go on and include apps like Skype and BlueJeans and Facebook Messenger, but for simplicity, I just put these three, Teams, Zoom, and WebEx, here as examples. These apps have recording functions and some are free, but they were all designed for video conferencing. So the recording features are very limited, and the streams being recorded are typically compressed by the internet for speed, and you don't have any control over the quality or file type. And if you're not perfect in one take, you would also need a separate editing app or video partner like VMG Studios that could edit it for you. Unless your video is about using one of these apps or showcasing people talking in them, I really don't recommend using them. There are, of course, other options I haven't mentioned here. So if you want to look for more options, feel free to browse the internet. These are just my recommendations based on price, ease of use, and security. Once you know which app you prefer, go ahead and download and install it. I'm not gonna go into the details of installation and use here, that's a different video, but I will cover some basic settings and configurations to help get you started. For this example, I'll use Camtasia, since I think its interface is most visually self-explanatory and it's simple to set up. Just open the app and select New Recording. You can also select it from the top menu. Now, before you do anything, no matter what app you're using, double check your save settings. Most of these apps will default to a system designated save location that you'll have a devil of a time finding later. Make sure the app prompts you for where you want to save your file every time you record. In Camtasia, you can do this by going to Preferences, 
and under the recording tab, set the after recording action to prompt to save. As a failsafe, you can also designate a save folder in a location you can easily find. Okay, back to the recording window. Here you'll see all the possible inputs or channels you can record from. On the far left is your computer display. You can toggle it on or off and select which screen you want to record, if you have more than one. You can also select just a specific app or a custom region, which in Camtasia gives you this very nice precision reticle. There are also size defaults, like 1080 and 720, and some for specific social destinations, like Instagram. Many of my recommended apps have these capabilities as well. In the webcam channel, we can toggle it on or off and select which webcam we want to record from if you have more than one. These two channels on the right are for audio. The first one is your microphone. Just like the webcam channel, we can toggle it on or off and select which mic we want to record if you have more than one plugged in. It also gives you this nice little volume or level preview so you can see if you're too hot or too quiet. And this slider here allows you to adjust your volume. If you're still too loud or quiet, try adjusting the physical position of your microphone. Pro tip, you want to max out your average level at about negative three dB. If you see red, you're too hot and you're clipping. The last channel here is your system audio. These are the computer clicks and dings, music, and any audio from videos you might want to play back. Sometimes this track is desirable and sometimes it's not. If you don't need to hear system audio, make sure this is turned off. And that's it. Now, before you hit record though, take stock of your computer screen and desktop. Make sure it's presentable. Ask yourself these questions. Is my desktop background appropriate for this video? Hide that distracting picture of your pet or kids and put up a system default background. Do I have a million desktop icons hanging around? If so, just make one folder, stuff them all in there temporarily and name it something benign, like desktop. If you're doing a business presentation, ask yourself, do I have any competitor apps or icons visible on screen? If so, hide those bad boys. Also ask, do I want my video to be timeless? If so, hide or turn off the date display on your taskbar. And here's a big one. What internet browser window tabs do I have open and visible? I have seen some doozy browser tab headings that were definitely not safe for work on some demos. So save yourself the embarrassment. Take a little care and consideration for the tidiness and professionalism of your computer's appearance. It'll pay off big time later. Okay, once you've got everything all set, you're ready to record. Or are you? Now that we've got things settled on the technical side, let's take a look at some aesthetic considerations. Aesthetics are probably the most important part of recording your own video. While mediocre equipment can have an impact on your audience, nothing will scream unprofessional like poor aesthetics. So if you can't afford any of the aforementioned accessories or apps, pay extra close attention now. In this section, we'll cover setting up yourself and your shot to make both look as good as possible, mic and camera placement, and we'll go over some performance tips. No matter how experienced you think you are, I guarantee you'll find at least a few nuggets in here that you hadn't considered. So buckle up. Let's start with location. This is one of those easily forgotten aspects. Please take a look around you right now. I mean it, take a look. Does it look like a good space to record a video in? Is it tidy? Does it echo when you speak? Is there a ton of nerd stuff in the background that might be distracting? Don't worry, no matter where you're recording, at work, at home, outside, there is a spot that will work. You just have to take a little extra time to find it. Let's take a tour of my house to see if we can find a good spot, starting right here. This is okay. It's basic and classic, but we risk the chance of someone walking past the door and being distracting. Mom! This isn't horrendous. The flat back wall is kind of meh, but the worst thing about this location is the hard top-down lighting on my face. It's not very pleasing. Too busy. And unless your topic is Legos or Star Wars, too personal. Nope. This is pretty, but the daylight behind me silhouettes me, making for a very contrasty image. And this is a common room, so I risk noise pollution. This is nice. The background is decent and the lighting isn't too bad, but I still risk noise pollution since I'm still in the common room. This is pretty and this could work, 
but it is weather dependent and you do risk some noise pollution from traffic or animals. And topically, I'm not talking about the outdoors, backyards, or gardening, so I'm not sure this is the most relevant location. Inevitably, I'll probably just stick with my office and do my best in here. For example, I might make sure that my background is pleasing and tidy and that there isn't too much to distract my audience. The last bit of setting aesthetics we should cover is lighting. Whenever possible, try to use natural light, meaning sunlight. You don't necessarily want to stand in direct sunlight as that might overexpose you, but a little diffused light from a window is much more pleasing than a hard top light from a ceiling mounted fluorescent. Fluorescent lights can make you look green and the shadows generated from a hard top down light are not always pleasing. If you can't get access to natural light, a neutral or slightly warm light is fine. Okay, now that we know where we're recording, let's get our mic set. There are some hard don'ts and some suggestions that are topically relevant. Don't put your microphone so far away that you're hard to hear. You want a good level and you don't want to pick up the room ambience any more than you have to. There can also be problems with putting the mic too close. Welcome to Moonlight Talks with Shauna. While that placement isn't exactly wrong, it definitely is more conducive to a more intimate reading or topic. Next is camera placement. We've all seen the memes about what it looks like when we take an accidental selfie. And if you haven't, go Google accidental selfie meme. I mean it, go. Google it now. I'll wait. Okay, see what I mean? This is what you look like when you don't practice good aesthetics in video conferencing and recording. So let's find out what does look good, shall we? Pleasing, not pleasing. Pleasing, not pleasing. Pleasing, mm -mm. not pleasing. Pleasing, hello? Pleasing. In general, I recommend you follow the rule of thirds for camera placement. Place your focal point around the top third line, either left, center, or right. That provides the most pleasing framing, as we call it in the business. And make sure your camera is at the same level as your eyes. As you saw in all of those accidental selfies, most of the worst looks were well below the person's eye line. You'll want to lower or raise either yourself or the camera to achieve the proper eye line between you and the camera. Okay, visually and audibly, we have a decent aesthetic using the surroundings and equipment we have available to us. The last aesthetic consideration we need to think about is performance. If you're recording yourself, don't touch the computer especially if you're using the computer-bound microphone. Even touching the desk can cause bad camera shake and loud impact noises in the microphone. So be careful. Make eye contact with the webcam, unless you're walking your audience through a step-by-step -step demo, in which case it would make sense to look at your screen, try to keep your focus on the camera. If you're sending your video to a video production house like VMG Studios, feel free to add lead and post time to your recordings. Lead and post time means that in between each and every take you record, you're leaving enough space to allow for a good edit or cut point. Don't jump on yourself. The same applies if you're interviewing each other. Leave enough time between question and answer so that you're not stepping on each other. On that note, if you know that you can edit your video, don't hesitate to do another take. You don't need to be perfect all the way through your video if you know you have the ability to edit. And if you're new to video production and you want some help, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at VMG Studios. We'll happily send you some options. Go slow, especially us millennials. People tend to speak fast when they're nervous. And it's okay to be nervous. Most people are when they're on camera. Just remember, talking more slowly is the easiest way to come across as knowledgeable and composed. It also helps prevent stumbling. Practice. Don't just hit record, tempting as it may be. I probably spent at least three to four days writing, preparing, and rehearsing this video before I even sat down to record. Even the best presenters practice. So please, afford yourself the same expectation. Lastly, dress to impact. No, I didn't say that wrong. Impressing people is overrated. You want impact. If your message is about video games, then your best business attire is overdoing it. If your company culture is casual, then dress casual. Just make sure you're put together. You know, brush your hair. Okay, now that we've done all this prep, we're finally ready to record. 
All the previous considerations may have seemed like a lot, but once you've established your expectations and made them all part of your routine practice, it actually can go quite quickly. And following these best practices will increase your impression and impact on your audience. You'll get more clicks, more comments, and more engagement. So back to the technical. Here we are in Camtasia. Our record settings are already ready to go. I just click record and three, two, one, we're recording. Probably the easiest step we've had so far. Once you've completed your recording, just follow the prompts to save. And there you go. If you're using one of the other programs, this would either be the final step or the point where you send your file to editing. Since we're in Camtasia, I'll give you a really quick tour of the editing options here. You can open a new project by going to File, New Project. This interface might look a bit intimidating, but it's actually quite simple. This here is your video window, where you can see your video live while you edit it. This down here is the timeline, where you can cut up your video and make other adjustments. And over here on the left is your action panel. In it are tabs like the media bin, where all the files you're using are stored, and special effects tabs like transitions, behaviors, options for your cursor, and so on. You can see here a little preview of each one as I hover over them. The neat thing about Camtasia is it records even your cursor on different metadata tracks in the special video file it generates after each recording. Their proprietary format, called a T-Rec file, allows you to toggle things on and off after recording. For example, let me bring in the video we just recorded. I'll go to the Media tab and import it, then drag it down to the timeline here. I can see the video and audio track separately, and I can scrub through them with this little playhead here. In the video window, I can see my web camera as a separate element on top of my screen recording. And I can grab it and move it around, make it bigger or smaller, and so on. I can also choose to make it the only thing that is visible on screen by enlarging it to fill the whole screen. Or I can just get rid of it entirely by pressing delete. I can do the same with the audio channels. The system audio by default is married to the screen capture video and the microphone audio is married to the webcam video. To see the audio separately, I can right click and separate them. Now I can see them individually. You can hear the music I was playing on the computer. Now I've decided I don't like that, so I can just cut it out or turn it down. Same with my voice. If I had a bad take, I can just cut that section out. On the screen recording track, I can add effects to my cursor, like position smoothing and highlights. Camtasia keeps metadata logs on when I clicked my mouse, so it will automatically add a visual or audible effect each time I clicked. There are many more options for customization and fixing in the Camtasia editor. I could go on and on, but that's better suited to another video. Once I've cut everything up the way I want, I can export the video or directly share it straight from Camtasia. For this video, I'll just save it locally. Choose where you want to save it and choose a file format. I'm a big fan of QuickTime because with the right settings, I can set it to be practically lossless. Apple ProRes 422 is a good default setting, so I would just keep it there. And then typically your recording or project dimensions are good enough. However, if you're not sure, just pick 1080. The only other format I might recommend is MP4. You just need to do a little more configuring. Make sure your frame rate is at least 30, especially if you have a webcam recording of yourself. Anything less will just make you look choppy. Set your dimensions, typically either 1080 or 720 and keep your data rate to automatic, or set a custom rate to be higher than that. The higher this setting, the better quality you'll get, but your file size will get bigger and bigger too. The rest is advanced features, so unless you know what you're doing, I recommend just leaving those as is. When you're done, just click export and watch it go. Depending on the size of your video and the capabilities of your machine, this may go fast or it may take a while. Just be patient. When it's done, you're done. And there you go. So here we are. A crash course in recording your own presentations remotely. 
If you'd like a free downloadable pre-flight checklist to help you remember everything you just learned, click the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to our channel, The Creative Toolkit for Marketers. Tell us how we're doing. You can find more videos and articles on the VMG Studios Learning Hub. And keep checking for updates too, as we're constantly expanding our library. Stay healthy, everyone, and keep creating.